Hello, everybody. I sure hope you're doing well tonight. I'm glad to be able to be with you again tonight. and Study God's Word together and sing some songs that teach us some things. I hope you're ready to get started. Let's sing the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Bible. That's right. Sometimes you might have to stand alone on the Word of God. Everybody else might leave you, but God is always right. So stay with Him. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Oh, let's sing this little light of mine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine all the time, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine all the time, let it shine. Won't let Satan it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine all the time, let it shine. You may be the only person in a circle of friends that knows anything about Jesus. So you want to make sure to live like he wants you to live and be like he wants you to be and tell the story of him like he wants it told. Oh, let's see. Let's do, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little ears what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Watch your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. Watch your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. Watch your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. Let's sing the books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts and a letter to the Romans. First and second Corinthians. Galatians and Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians. First and second Thessalonians. First and second Timothy. Titus and Philemon. Hebrews, James. First and second Peter. First and second and third John. Jude and Revelation. And let's sing the names of the apostles. Jesus called them one by one. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Next came Philip, Thomas too. Matthew and Bartholomew. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. And they all followed him. Good to remember things that way, isn't it? We haven't sung the days of creation for a while. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day three, day three, God made the land and flowers and trees. 
Day three, day three, God made the land and flowers and trees. Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Day five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Six day, six day, God made beasts and man that day. Six day, six day, God made beasts and man that day. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. Now remember, there's another song about creation that we just learned recently, and maybe I can remember the words to it. Creepy caterpillar climbing in a tree. He wiggled short, he wiggled long, he wiggled right at me. Put him in a box, don't go away, I said. When I opened up the box, a butterfly instead. I could never make one, even if I tried. Only God in heaven can make a butterfly. Slimy little tadpole swimming in a lake. He wiggled short, he wiggled long, he wiggled like a snake. Put him in a jar, don't go away, I said. When I opened up the jar, a frog jumped out instead. I could never make one, even if I try. Only God in heaven can make a frog jump high. And there's one more song about creation I've been wanting to teach you. You might know it already, and maybe I just don't know that you know it. Well, it's not so much about creation, but about how, how God is powerful enough to create and how he owns everything because he made it. It goes like this. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the trees are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Maybe we'll sing that one again next week. Before our Bible class learning, let's sing our Bible class song. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. For God loves you and I love you and your teacher loves you too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. For God loves you and I love you and your teacher loves you too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. I want you to get ready because someday soon we're going to review some things from that white card, like the Ten Plagues and the Ten Commandments and where things are found. But right now we're working on this green card in the Gospel of John. And if I were to ask you what chapter tells us that Jesus is God, our Creator, you would say chapter 1. And if I asked you what chapter says water to wine, that Jesus turned water to wine, that would be chapter and if I asked you what chapter says that Jesus taught Nicodemus, what chapter would that be? Chapter 3. And if I asked you what chapter Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, what chapter would that be? That's 5. I went out of order, didn't I? And if I asked you what chapter Jesus turned one boy's lunch into a great big meal for lots of people when Jesus... Uh, made uh, when Jesus fed 5,000 people with, with just five loaves of bread and two fish, what would that chapter be? You know it as Jesus is the bread of life. Chapter 6. In what chapter did Jesus teach a woman at a Samaritan well? Chapter 4. In what chapter did Jesus teach in the temple? Chapter 7. Remember, he said, do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In what chapter did Jesus talk about, talk to a woman taken in adultery, telling her to go and sin no more? 
John chapter 8. And in what chapter did Jesus heal a blind man? John chapter 9. Now we're going to learn the next four tonight. John chapter 10, Jesus is the true shepherd. Jesus said in that chapter, I am the good shepherd. He'd say that several times with different taglines on the end of it that were very, very, very meaningful, as meaningful as they could possibly be. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, he said. I am the good shepherd, and my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. And Jesus compared a shepherd to a thief. The thief steals, kills, destroys but the shepherd, Jesus, the shepherd, gives life to people. He cares about people. That's what that means. Jesus is the true shepherd, and that's in John chapter 10. Then in John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. You might remember the story. Lazarus, oh, he was sick, and Jesus found out that he was sick, but Jesus waited a little bit because he wanted to show the glory of God. When he finally was on the way there, he heard that Lazarus, well, he knew ahead of time that Lazarus had died. When he got there, Lazarus' sisters came to him one by one and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. I am the resurrection and the life. Then Jesus eventually went to Lazarus' tomb. He'd been buried for four days. But Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came up out of that tomb with his grave clothes wrapped around him and all. And everybody was amazed. Everybody was astonished. Jesus could raise people from the dead. Now, I know that doesn't happen now. I know that's against the laws of science. But Jesus is the one who made the laws of science. And so he could break them now and then when he wanted to to prove his point. That's what he did with the raising of Lazarus. Then in John chapter 12, something very different happens. Jesus makes a prediction. And it's not a prediction about resurrection. It's a prediction about death. Jesus predicts his own death. In several ways, really. There was a woman who had some very costly oil, perfume-like stuff. She came and used it on Jesus' feet to anoint his feet. And then she loved him so much that she took her long hair and she wiped his feet with her hair. Now, one of the disciples got really upset about that and said, this, this perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor. But Jesus said, leave her alone. She has anointed me ahead of time for my burial. And then later in the chapter, he said that his soul was troubled because the hour for which he had come was there. That means the hour of his death. And then he said a little bit later on, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Do you know what it meant to be lifted up from the earth? On a cross. Your feet were lifted up from the earth and you were hung there between earth and heaven. And he died on the cross for us. So in John chapter 12, Jesus predicted his death. Well, in John chapter 9, Jesus healed the blind man. In John chapter 10, Jesus is the true shepherd. In John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 12, Jesus predicts his own death. And in John chapter 13, he washes his disciples' feet. Oh, man, that's something, isn't it? Jesus was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He was everything. He was the creator. He's in charge of things. He owns things. He owns the whole world. And he could boss people around if he wanted to. But he came to serve people and help people. Now, to show the disciples that, here's what he did. On the night before his death, he got down on his hands and knees and took a towel and a water basin and went around and washed the dirty feet of all of those disciples. Can you imagine washing somebody else's feet? That's just kind of gross, isn't it? It was a custom back then, but usually slaves did it. But Jesus, here's so he's the, he's the master and the teacher and the most wonderful person of all. But he serves by washing the disciples' feet. That's something to remember when our parents ask us to do something and we don't want to do it because we think we're too good for that. Jesus wasn't too good for things like that. And that's something to remember when we think it's not fair that we have to do something. Jesus wasn't worried about what was fair. He just did something to try to help people. Isn't that wonderful of Jesus? So John chapter 10, Jesus is the true shepherd. John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus. 
John chapter 12, he predicts his own death. In John chapter 13, he washes his disciples' feet. John chapter 13, he washes his disciples' feet. John chapter 12, he predicts his own death. John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And John chapter 10, he's the true shepherd. You get all 13 of those chapters memorized for next week, if you haven't already, okay? Now, tonight we're going to sing our song that we always end with, but I decided we'd sing the other two verses as well for people who are a little bit older, about how it applies to them. And to remind us of it, I set up the, the screen here. So here we go. Do you know, little child, what is in you? Can you dream, little child, of going far? Do you know, little child, of the power you've been given? Do you know, little child, whose you are? You were made in the image, in the image of God, just a little bit below the angels. And the masterpiece of heaven's hand is your body and your soul. You were made in the image, you were made in the image, you were made in the image of God. In the image of God, do you see, child of God, who is in you? Do you see, child of God, where you belong? Do you see, child of God, Christ the Lord who dwells within you? Do you see, child of God, who makes you strong? You were made in the image, in the image of God, just a little bit below the angels. And the masterpiece of heaven's hand is your body and your soul. You were made in the image, you were made in the image, you were made in the image of God, in the image of God. God. Do you care, precious one, who is in you? Do you care, precious one, who's in your soul? Do you care, precious one, for the temple of the Spirit? Do you care, precious one, to be whole? You were made in the image, in the image of God, just a little bit below the angels. And the masterpiece of heaven's hand is your body and your soul. You were made in the image, you were made in the image, you were made in the image of God, in the image of God. Let's pray. Your God, thank you so much for all you've given us. Thank you for these young people who were made in your image. Help them never to forget that, but always study you, learn about you, so that they can live their lives for you and come to heaven and be with you someday forever and ever and ever. Help them now to be strong. Help them to be healthy. Help them to do well and learn and grow. Be with their parents and those others who take care of them. Help them to have strength and help them to have wisdom in all the decisions they make. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, all of you here for the teen adult class, I went a little bit long in the children's class, but that's okay because the last two verses of that song we just sang are really more for teenagers. It speaks of a time that they might reach the age of accountability, decide to become Christians, and then Christ and the Holy Spirit dwell in them, according to Scripture. And we want them to care about that and hope to remember that we need to conduct ourselves in such a way that we have God within us. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Now to segue to our class, let me go to this slide that I showed you just a minute ago and recap just a little bit of Paul's first missionary journey. He and Barnabas and John Mark took off from Antioch over there on the right of your screen. And then they went down to Seleucia, which was the seaport. And then they went over to the island of Cyprus, where they preached in the synagogues in Salamis. 
And then a little bit later in chapter 13, they went to the west side of the island of Cyprus, to the town of Paphos, where there was a proconsul named Sergius Paulus that had a sorcerer named Bar Jesus following him around all the time. Bar Jesus tried to keep the Sergius Paulus from obeying the gospel, but it didn't work because Paul, by the power of God, struck him blind, struck the sorcerer blind. Sergius Paulus was amazed at the teaching of the apostles, and he became a believer in Christ. After that, they sail north to Perga. That's where John Mark leaves them. It becomes a point of contention later. And then they go through very treacherous territory, walking, hiking, up about 3,500 feet and about 100 miles, up to the city of Antioch. In Antioch and Pisidia, Paul gives a speech in the synagogue that really kind of gets him in trouble. Some of the Jews believe, some of the Greeks believe eventually, but then some of them drive him out of town. That's where he shakes the dust off his feet as a testimony against them, along with Barnabas. And they go on to a city called Iconium. That's where we pick up in Acts chapter 14, starting at verse 1, the city of Iconium. In Acts chapter 14, verse 1, we read this. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. It's an interesting thing that here Jews and Greeks together believe. We've made much about how the church in the early days had to overcome some racial barriers, and now in this city at least, they don't seem to have those contentions. It's just that Jews and Greeks are believing together and being part of the same body and getting along with one another, apparently, to start with. That's a beautiful thing. Notice also another theme that we've seen that Paul preaches in the synagogues. When he goes to even these pagan cities, if there's a synagogue of Jews there, he goes there first. The gospel went to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. He goes to the synagogues and he preaches there and, and the synagogue would have held some Greeks who were proselytes, and then word probably spread about, what we have here is a summary of what happened really, word probably spread about, and there might have been some preaching in marketplaces, there might have been some preaching house to house, but Jews and Greeks believed. How many? A multitude of them. A multitude. I hear of missionaries that go to places where people's souls are soft for the word of God, and multitudes of people are converted. Sometimes whole denominations are converted to the Lord's church, and sometimes a whole bunch of people who are pagan or in some other religion come to the gospel of Christ. Multitudes came, and that's just an amazing and encouraging thing to see. But, verse 2, you want to talk about encouraging? Here's discouraging. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. The unbelieving Jews. Now, that's an interesting word to be used there because a lot of times in the New Testament, when that Greek word is used, it really means disobedient. And sometimes it's translated that way. For example, in uh, John chapter 3, verse 36, if you'd like to look there, the word believe is used two times in the New King James Version and the King James Version. But the American Standard Version has it a little bit differently. And and other versions have it a little bit differently. Matter of fact, I may have a slide here to show you about that. Let's see. Yes, I do. The word unbelieving in verse 2 means disobedient. In John chapter 3, verse 36, here's what it says. He who, and that's the Greek word pistuo, believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who, a pathon, that's a different Greek word, the son shall not see life. Well, that's the way it is in the New King James Version. He who believes in the son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the son shall not see life. But the American Standard Version probably has a better translation there. It says, he that believeth on the son hath eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You see, the second word there is really not believe, it's obey. So he who believes the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life. And here in Acts chapter 14, 
verse 2, the word unbelieving could really be translated and probably should be translated disobedient. But disobedient Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. There's a point to be made there that it's hard to imagine that we could ever hammer enough in view of the current religious circumstances. And that is that belief has to equal obedience, or it's not really belief at all. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. If a person says, I believe in you, but then they don't trust you with anything to do, it's hard to imagine that they really believe in you, that they really trust you, if there's not action following up the belief. Well, this is the same with Christ. And I know, the, I know those passages that tell us if we believe on him, we can have salvation. But you see, those passages have, in, have this in mind, that belief is naturally going to segue to obedience because that is real belief. So unbelieving Jews is actually in the ancient mindset, a synonym for disobedient Jews. And in John chapter three, verse 36, he who does not believe in the son has, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. That's the same as saying he who does not obey the son does not have everlasting life because belief and obedience are so intertwined as to be almost synonyms, as to be almost alike, completely alike to each other. That's a good point to remember. At any rate, some of these unbelieving Jews, some of these disbelieving Jews, weren't going to have any of this about Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah. They didn't like that too well, and they weren't going to have it. So they poisoned their minds, the minds of the Gentiles, against the brethren. They poisoned their minds. How do you poison someone's mind? Well, you just talk bad things about them. If you might not be able to argue on the merits of a particular case, you just talk badly about a person and you poison their minds against somebody. You ever have somebody just gossip when they shouldn't be, of course, shouldn't be gossiping, but they tell you about somebody else and you kind of get a bad impression of them before you ever meet them? That's poisoning your minds. Matthew chapter 27, verse 20. Remember that the crowds in Jerusalem cheered Jesus when he entered the city on a colt, the foal of a donkey at his triumphal entry. Then just a week later, they're shouting for his crucifixion. Why was that? Matthew chapter 27, verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The chief priests and elders got in on it and went through the crowd, tried to persuade people against Jesus when he didn't have a chance to answer for himself. They, they, they make a charge and they wouldn't allow him to answer in this particular situation. And I think I've mentioned to you before, I know I have, that in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 18, Jeremiah had the truth of the matter. The false prophets did not have the truth of the matter, but they would not give in to the truth. Their stubbornness led them to just try to discredit Jeremiah. Then they said, Jeremiah said, here's, here's what they plotted according to Jeremiah, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah for the law shall not perish from the priest nor counsel from the wise nor the word from the prophet. That is, he's a wise person. He's not going to stop talking. He's a prophet. He's not going to stop teaching the word of God. He's a priest. He's not going to stop telling us the law of God. So come and let us attack him with the tongue and let us not give heed to any of his words. We're going to assassinate his character. Have you ever seen situations where you think that people lose an argument based on the reasonability of an argument, and so they spend all their time just in character assassination of the other side, of the people who don't agree with them? I think we see that a lot in our culture. We see that a lot in uh, cancel culture, as it's called. We see it a lot sometimes in politics. And it's a sad thing. We ought to be able to debate based on the merits of an argument and not poison each other's minds against somebody just on some personal particular trait or, or some mistake that was made years ago or something like that. Uh, mistakes are mistakes and sins are sins. Sins can be forgiven. It seems like we live in a very unforgiving time, though, doesn't it? Uh, and I... 
that's just a sad thing. Well, these Jews, these disobedient Jews, these unbelieving Jews, poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against the brethren. See, the Gentiles were entering the kingdom now, and the Jews were were were, were going to the Gentiles, and I don't know what they were saying. I don't know how they were getting it across, but somehow they were convincing these pagan Gentiles that they should not listen to Paul and Barnabas. Therefore, verse 3, therefore they, that's Paul and Barnabas, therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hand. Therefore, why therefore? Because people were believing or because people were poisoning the minds of the Gentiles against them? I think it's both. When you see the word therefore, you look to see what it's there for. Well, in verse 1, they're getting a multitude of believers. That's a good reason to stay. In verse 2, they have people poisoning the minds of the listeners against what the missionaries have to say. And they stay because of that, too, to try and straighten things out, defend themselves, defend more than themselves, defend Jesus Christ. So they spoke boldly. Sometimes you have opportunity in the face of adversity, and that's what they did. They had opportunity in the face of adversity. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, a great and effective door has been opened to us, and there are many adversaries. Sometimes there's a great opportunity there. The uh, apostles then speak boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They speak boldly in the Lord. They've done that before. Remember in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, when the Sanhedrin saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were unlearned and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And then after Peter and John are led away from the Sanhedrin, they go to their own companions, I believe the other apostles, and do you know what they pray for? They pray for boldness. Acts 4, verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. And he granted it. They did. In verse 31, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Then in chapter 9, verse 27, when Saul of Tarsus is converted and tries to join the disciples at Jerusalem, they don't want to see him first because they're afraid that he's still a Jew that's persecuting Christians. But Barnabas takes them to him and declares how he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus, chapter 9, verse 27. And then in verse 29, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. And he disputed so much that they tried to kill him. They attempted to kill him. That's boldness. Sometimes the word of God requires some bold speaking in the face of all of the sin. We want to be as kind as we can. We want to be as gentle as we can. But sometimes there's a time for just outright boldness. So they boldly spoke in the name of the Lord. Verse 3 continues, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace. I don't want to hammer that too much because I know I have in the book of Acts, but God bore witness by miracles, doing signs and wonders. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, God also bearing witness both with signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. He was bearing witness to the word of his grace. Now that's another way of saying the word of God, but isn't it an interesting way to say it? Because back a little bit earlier in chapter 38, chapter 13, verses 38 and 39, we learned that uh, Paul was telling the people they could be justified by Christ of all things by which they could not be justified in the law of Moses. So there was a contrast between the law of Moses and Christ. The law of Moses just pointed out sin, but Christ offered forgiveness. And then in chapter 14, verse or, or uh, chapter 14, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse uh, 43, they went, uh, they continued to persuade them to continue in the grace of God. We discussed that last time. They, they were persuaded to continue in the grace of God. Don't go back to the law of Moses. Continue in the grace of God. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, the apostle Paul is speaking to the elders from Ephesus. He tells them as he's about to depart from them, so now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of his grace. This is not a harsh word. 
although there will be harsh penalty for not obeying. It's not a harsh word. It's the word of God's grace that tell us, tells us as bad as we are, as many sins as we've committed, as often as we've done those things, we can be forgiven. But we have to be believers. We have to be obedient. We have to do the very best that we can. But we can be forgiven because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. He's bearing witness to the word of his grace. You know what happens next? There's a division, verse 4. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. Well, that's interesting. Jesus is supposed to be the Prince of Peace, but there's division. The city was divided before, probably, if it was like most cities in that region. It had its pagan people. It's had its Jewish people. But now the division is between whether or not to follow Christ whether or not to follow the Jewish people. Part sided with the Jews and part sided with the apostles. Remember that Jesus said, do you think that I came to bring peace on the earth? Not at all. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. For from now on, five in one house will be divided against one another. Three against two and two against three. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. When the word of Christ is preached, it causes division because some people won't obey it. Then how can the people who will obey it be unified with people who won't obey it? It's inevitable that it will cause some division. Even though Jesus is the Prince of Peace and even though he himself is our peace, Ephesians 2, Verse 14, he came to break down the wall of partition that was between Jew and Gentile. He's our peace between God and the devil. Maybe I can find a better way to say that. We've sinned and so we're at enmity with God. And he is our peace because he offers forgiveness. Yet when the, the gospel is preached and some people believe and some people don't, there's going to be a divide. Because Jesus is like, like no other. He has the best moral way for us. He has the only moral way for us, the only religious way that makes any sense, the only way that can get us to salvation. And when people disagree with that, it is not as if Christians can say, well, okay, we accept you this way too. We can't agree with that in fellowship with a rejection of Christ, his doctrine and his principles. That doesn't mean that Christians ought to be mean to people who don't believe in Christ. No, they ought to be kind and ought to be lights to the world. But it means that we can't endorse and we can't fellowship everything that's out there. Christ will bring division. Sometimes even within the close confines of a family. That's a sad thing. But in the end, we need to be loyal to the one who shed his own precious spotless blood for us rather than the people into whose blood we happen to be born. Then in verse 5, they're going to try to incite some violence. Verse 5, And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, a violent attempt was made to abuse and stone them. I read a little bit about that word for abuse, and it's a pretty strong word, meaning that they meant to mistreat them, they meant to harm them. Someone said it's not quite as strong as we might think of with the word torture, but they're planning to stone them, and that usually meant death. That was the purpose of stoning. So a violent attempt came. Well, we've noticed before that human nature is this. When you can't win an argument based on its merits, you go to character assassination, and when you can't win by character assassination, you go to violence, and sometimes tragically we see that in our society as well. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 19, he noticed that very thing that the people had plotted against him, that they wanted him dead at one point, and well, probably several other points, because he just wouldn't stop preaching. He says, but I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter, and I did not know that they had devised schemes against me, saying, 
Let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be remembered no more. Let's destroy the tree. He's got His fruit is his preaching, so let's destroy the tree. Let's cut him off from the land of the living, so his name won't be remembered anymore. His name is remembered. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what happened to him in his death. Some traditions probably say that he died a martyr's death. We're talking about it. His name is remembered. He spoke the truth. But people will resort to violence sometimes. There are still re-education camps, or whatever you want to call them, in some countries in this world where people are being interned against their will simply because they're following Christ. There are places where Christians are, are maligned maliciously. Uh, I guess that would be redundant. They're maliciously uh, mocked and uh, sometimes it seems to take on a new uh, level in this country that previous generations haven't known. You wonder when it might turn to violence. You hope that it doesn't. You pray that it doesn't and for places who don't have it. And for those places who do have it, you pray that they might have some relief from their persecution. Also notice here that politics makes strange bedfellows. Who was teaming up against Paul and Barnabas here? In verse 5, who was it? It was the Jews and the Gentiles together. Now, earlier in verse 1, the Jews and Gentiles teamed up together to believe, and that's a teamwork of love and acceptance in the Lord's church. But now, in verse 5, a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews, and this is team, the teamwork of hatred. They put aside their differences to become members of the body of Christ in the former case. And then in the second case, they put aside their differences because they had a common enemy that they wanted to kill. The latter is quite tragic. The former is beautiful. And one of the great reasons that Christ came. So when the disciples saw this, do you know what they did? They fled. Verse 6. They became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycania, and to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. They fled. Now, someone asked the question in one of the commentaries I was reading, is it right for them to flee? Are they being cowards? He examined it for a while and came to the same conclusion I would, and that probably you would too, that it's a matter of judgment in each particular situation. There had been times that the apostles had not fled. Peter and John, after being before the Sanhedrin, got themselves back in front of the Sanhedrin with the rest of the apostles in Acts chapter 5. They were in prison first for preaching, and then they were let out of prison, and the angel told them to go to the temple and speak all the words of this life. They didn't wait till late in the day. They got up early in the morning and went to the temple, right back where they were arrested before. They were bold about it. And then in uh, a little bit earlier in this chapter, they stayed, remember, therefore, they stayed because there was opposition in part and because there was success in part. They stayed as long as they felt that they could do some good. But when they felt that it was time that they could not do any good, we don't, we don't know the reasons that they left. I doubt that it was cowardice. I'm sure that it was not cowardice. The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, sorcerers, liars, sexually immoral, idolaters shall all have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21, verse 8. Why would they leave then? Well, just like shaking the dust off their feet in Antioch and Pisidia, maybe they'd come to the point that they realized they just couldn't do any good anymore. And then there are some other things that I wonder about. I wonder if the time came that they thought, we'll leave for the sake of the brethren who are here. There had been enough uproar. There had been enough turning the world upside down. Well, maybe that's not the way to say it. They were turning, turning the world upside down. But there had been enough uproar. There had been enough turmoil. Maybe if they left, things would calm down for the Christians who were there. There are a lot of things to take into consideration. It's a matter of judgment in each particular case whether 
missionaries leave a particular area or stay there. They don't want to leave while things are going well. They want to strike while the iron is hot, so to speak. But when things start to slow down, when persecution comes, when violence starts, the violence probably would not stop with just the missionaries. It would probably spread to the church, and maybe one reason they left was to keep their brethren safe. I just don't know for sure. At any rate, we dare not judge them for leaving, because that sometimes that just might be the thing to do. They go on to teach other people. I remember a while back that someone told me this saying that some other preacher said, and that was that everyone has the right to hear the gospel once more than anybody has the right to hear it multiple times. There's so many who hear it multiple times and do nothing about it. And there are many people out there that need to hear it for the first time. So they went on. Then they come to the cities of Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycania. I think that's how I, I looked it up and listened to the pronunciation online. That's how you pronounce it, Lycania, although I used to say Lycaonia. And so they go from Antioch east to Iconium there. And then they're going to go about 30 to 40 miles southwest. These maps are courtesy of a person who took my online class in Acts 1 through 14, and uh, his name's Graham, Mortis, Graham Morrison. So they go from Iconium down about 30, 40 miles southwest to Lystra, and then they're going to go to Derby from there, and then they're going to backtrack, but we'll leave those studies for another time. I hope this study might have been helpful. You see, the Word of God has power. And sometimes the word of God has a power that excites men's passions in a negative way. That's unfortunate, that's sad, that's tragic, and that's terrible. But it's going to happen. We need to be able to deal with it as the apostles did. Sometimes we need to speak boldly. And sometimes it might be time to go on. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for our time in the word tonight. Thank you for giving us your word. Help us to be people who love you and serve you to the very best of our ability. We pray that people will love each other, that the principles of Christ will reign in the world more and more, that the kingdom of Christ would grow more and more, that more and more people would be Christians, treating each other well, serving you, and having the hope of heaven. Father, we pray more and more people will focus on the next life more than this life. Although this life has its problems and its, its inadequacies, its sin that causes so much strife and turmoil, we're so thankful that we can look forward to a place where those things won't exist if we are believers, obedient believers. We pray that you'd be with our leaders, guide them, that they might make wise decisions. Work through them, Father, even if they really aren't servants of yours. We don't know how you do that, but we know you do from Old Testament teachings and Old Testament examples. We pray that you work through them for the good of the citizenry everywhere, that people might live in peace and quietness and reverence. Father, we pray that you would intervene in the injustices of our land, including the children who are abused, the babies who are aborted in the womb, the people who are in sex trafficking slavery, the people who are persecuted because of their race. We pray that you would intervene in all these, all these systems of oppression and cause them to come to an end, and cause people at least one by one to be saved from them cause these, these outrages to come to an end. We pray that riots would come to an end, that people would be heard, but be heard peacefully in their grievances. We pray that you would help us through the virus, cause the virus and the separation that it's wreaking upon people to end. We pray that the church can grow again. We pray that the church can grow from this. We pray that the church can grow together, grow in number, grow in zeal, grow in knowledge, 
teach other people, be able to take whatever comes from it. Father, we pray for resurgence of religious attention, a revival, a renewal of people wanting to do what is right in your sight, recognizing and acknowledging you as the one true and living God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If we could help you, study with you about your soul, we'd love to do that. Believe and repent, confess and be baptized. That's the plan of salvation to get started. Be faithful to him. And that takes a lot of learning and a lot of doing. And we'd love to help if we could do that. Let's just reach out and let us know. Thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate you very much. Lord willing, we'll be here Sunday morning on uh, Facebook Live at 1040 for our worship service at Hillview Terrace. I'll be preaching at that time. And then Sunday afternoon at five o'clock, our, our uh, intern Rod Goddard will be preaching in this fashion here. Thank you. Good night.